Arsenal fans confront emotional turmoil as they try to determine how distraught to be while still being top of the table. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right. We're all today trying to decide if the season is over. If that's it, it's done. While having to blink a few times and refresh the webpage we're looking at, as it tells us we are still sitting top of the table with a game in hand. Granted, we're not technically top of the table. We're second on goal difference. But, you know, we're there. We're, we're tied on points and we have a game in hand. It, it is really, really hard because <clears throat> as I look out into the conversations being had, both, you know, m- among friends on WhatsApp and um, you know, on social media, there's a lot of, can we still finish top four? You know, can we can we still make Europe? Like there's, there's a lot of um, catastrophizing and I totally understand it and connect to it emotionally. But the players and the managers sure don't have the luxury of connecting to that because they must feel and should rightly feel that they are still in the thick of a title race. And at the end of the day, if we match City's results the rest of the way, we're champions. It's that simple, right? With the game in hand, right? Obviously, any point from that game in hand. If we match their results and take anything from the game in hand, we're champions. They've got Champions League. We've got Europa League. They've got FA Cup. It's not going to be straightforward. There's probably going to be more twists and turns. I do accept that we look like we're in a slump now, and it has to be arrested immediately. <clears throat> Whoever's guilty of the slump needs to be arrested immediately. Uh, preferably, you know, <clears throat> Manchester City's players. That might help us. But, you know, aside from that, like, we we do need... We do need to obviously get this back on track. But so one of the things I want to do to start this pod today is really try to contextualize where we are emotionally, where we are in the season, and 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 where we're headed now. We'll go through the game. A first half that I think had a lot to it and felt like the occasion that was built up. A second half that, to me, didn't feel that way, that felt like the emotion had come out of the event somehow, that, that it was a non-event in the second half, and that's really the disappointment I feel today. So we'll see how Tim and uh, Clive feel about it. Tim's on Twitter, at Stillmanator. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Unlike Arsenal, who are now in a slump, I feel like I have come out of my uh, Twitter handle slump, and I'm just now, you know, playing out the season on on a title run here myself of getting Tim's Twitter handle correct. We'll see how that ends at the end of the pod. And Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Hello, indeed. Do want to say love to everybody for being here. I think it's in the moments that it hurts the most when I look forward to seeing Tim and Clive and Paul and you know Scott and and whoever you know we're talking to. Phil Costa was on the instant reaction last night when I value these conversations and value this community and really value everyone who's here listening to our voices today. So thank you for being here. I know these are the moments when we kind of need each other the most when it's great. It's really easy to just be like, Hey, this is fun. When it's not great. It's a lot harder to have a sober conversation about it. So Clive, where I want to start with this is just where your head is at kind of a, a sanity check on where we go from here. Like, did this feel to you? And does this feel to you like a nail in the coffin for a young team trying to fly too close to the sun is, did you feel like this was the end of the title charge? And I'm not saying it is factually. I'm saying where where are you right now emotionally with what our season has to offer in the wake of the defeat? Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to go to almost all the big games this season. And I find these the most instructive games. So when you walk into these games, you have to almost like really open your eyes wide and see what you can learn because this is the next step. And to be fair to Arsenal this year, they've really, on every big game, I've come out thinking, you know what, we're really good. And there's a little bit of that in this one. But also in the last, I, I can't help but look at the last few games and see what's changing and see what we need to change and see what people are uncovered with us. And I do think over the season, we, you evolve tactically. But there's a, there is a trend here in what teams are doing. And I do think it's time to answer that trend and make changes to what we're doing. It doesn't mean much. It's just it's just simple things. I've got a few. I don't want to go through them now, but um, I've got a few. And I just think these teams are now really respecting us and they're looking at us. They're looking at how we play, looking at how we shape up, and they're really challenging us and they're changing how they play. I mean, Man City, the way they played against us with that system, that shape, that close grouping in the front three, Blocking the centre, no, we want giving us the outsides, playing within our shape. Hey, did Everton do something similar? Mm. Didn't Newcastle do something similar? Didn't Brentford do something similar? They're letting us have the touchline, smashing us out there wide. Takes four fouls for you get a booking, and then when we come inside, they 
they they they snap onto us, jump onto us, and transition either in in two three passes or one straight pass. So we have to change a little bit. We and we and we have tried to, but I think we have to change again. You know, we've got to take the long ball away, up the size of our back line. We've lost Thomas Party out the middle, so we need to make some changes. And and that and that's fine. It's it's been two or three games we've looked at this. And to be fair, a couple of chances taken last night, we might feel differently. But no, there's a trend here, isn't there? There's a trend here by how we're being approached. And if you're any team watching what's happened in the last three games or so, we'll be watching that trend. They're going to set up accordingly. If Man City can do it, Villa can do it. Leicester can do it. And so we have to combat this and make a change to do it and then go again the next evolution, the next phase of Arsenal. So just to summarise, Elliot, I don't feel it's terminal. I think it's a learning experience as long Mm. as we learn. Well, yeah, I mean, everything's a learning experience if if you learn from it or it's just, um, it's it's wasted, right? It's a wasted moment. So we have to make sure we don't waste this moment. I mean, I think it's interesting because there is a, a set of statistics going around that Manchester City recorded their lowest totals for possession, 36%. Passing accuracy, 72%. And successful passes, 219 in a Premier League match under Pep Guardiola against Arsenal tonight. There are more advanced metrics, their lowest expected threat, their lowest this, their lowest that. I can't help but feel that's by design. That they, you know, there's a, I don't, I'm going to get it wrong, but there's a type of martial arts, maybe it's jujitsu or one of those things, that sort of uses your momentum against you, right? Tim, is it Brazilian jiu-jitsu? I'll, I'll ask you since you're the Brazilian guy. Do you know? I, I don't know, but okay. I have heard that concept okay. yeah, of using yeah. someone's yeah. momentum and, against them. And it almost felt like City played us that way, that they knew they, they believed they could win some of the physical battles up front with Holland, that they believed that their best way to, put, to take us apart was to capitalize on our errors. And maybe that's a learning they took away from the FA Cup where – we were able to exploit, expose them a bit. We were able to have some joy, and maybe Pep looked at the Everton games and the and and the um, Brentford game and said, you know, if you go into one v one battles against their back line long, if you if you play for their errors, that's where they're vulnerable. Um, I, I don't I don't know that, that to be the case, but like the problem is when I look at those statistics that are floating around. I don't think they're reflective of a game Arsenal dominated. I don't think anybody would describe it that way. <coughs> Certainly in the first half, you could you could say that we we were the better side, potentially. The second half, no way. So it is interesting to see, have teams decided, okay, you know what? You've gotten quite good at having the ball and pushing teams back and possessing it and, and pressing. So we're just going to let you do those things, and we're going to play to expose the, your, your weaknesses in other ways. I don't know. We'll, we'll come on to the tactical component of it a little more detail in a moment. But, but Tim, I want to stay on the, the psychological aspect of it for you. Mm-hmm. Um there is a lot of catastrophizing of this in the wake of this loss. I mean, there are people, and look, you got you can see every bad opinion on the internet, right? They're all out there. And if you if you choose to make that representative of how people are feeling, you can get into a bad place. But I'm getting text messages from people like, do you think United will get past us now? You know, is top four a concern? Or do you think we have it locked up? And like, I'm looking at the table and I still see a team that's tied on points at the top with a game in hand. So there's definitely a feeling after this game that that's it, title done, focus on the the pit below us from some people. And obviously the, the, the team can't afford to have that mentality. How hard do you think it'll be for them to really still believe and to what extent are you struggling <laughs> to still believe? Yeah, yeah. Look on the on the Patreon preview we did. I said it. I think it was in my mind anyway. It was as simple as whoever wins this game, I think, will go on to win the league. And I, mm. I do think that. I do think City are going to do it now. Um, yeah, like you're right. We're still in a. We're still in the best position. We're still in a better position. Um, but momentum is such an important thing in these title races. Seen it many, many times before over the years where you just look at a team, they get the momentum in the right part of the season, i.e. after February, March. That that tends to be uh, and that tends to be the best time to get it. Um but and, and I think I think for me as well, because like and again I think all of us knew when we were on 50 points after 19 games, we probably weren't going to get 100 points. There was going to be like a little bit of a slowing of that pace. But really, I think you're looking for that slowing to be a bit more spread out than three games. I think you're looking at, oh, we got a draw in January. 
and maybe we lost a big game in April and a draw in March or something like you don't expect it to come in like three games um and and so that means that there's you know there's certainly more in the post we're not going to win every game that we've got left this season I think the thing that's punctured my belief the most though was looking at the players at the final whistle I because yeah you messaged us about this I'd love for yeah. you to explain it yeah 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 like because essentially what you're looking for like this this is about like I said like Arsenal are still in the dominant position but why does no one think that why does no one feel that because it feels like it's slipping out of Arsenal's fingers and and that's really the impression I got from the players um at full time there was a big at the final whistle, like in, in the North Bank, there was a big chant of Arsenal, Arsenal. And I thought there was a real opportunity there for the players, you know, for, for a moment of unity, a defiance, moment, right? almost yeah. defiance. Yeah. yeah. Particularly when you've got Man City on the pitch celebrating. And I don't want to over index this. I don't think like our players going and thumping their chests wins us the league or anything. But I thought there was a real chance there to say, all right you've won the battle, but you're not winning the war. You know, we don't think this is slipping through our fingers. This is a one-off game. We're still in the dominant position. So much has been done to cultivate that, that fan player relationship and personal. And and may, again, maybe I'm overreacting because of how I responded emotionally at the time. Like I, I still feel really down about this. This is the most a defeat has hurt in quite a long time. Like mm. I, I didn't like look at Twitter on the way home. I just and I, I never did. Like I always want to read what people are saying about a game. Like no matter what, generally. But after this, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to see any of the reaction. I didn't want to read any of the interviews or anything. I just put music on and went home. Yeah. But like my my, I, I rose a little bit when I heard that chant at the end. And I felt that kind of that that sense of defiance, and then the players, most of them sat down, and a lot of them went down the tunnel. And I get that they're really disappointed at that point, but I found that really disappointing just because of the connection that's been built up, and it's a little bit harmful to do that. I felt like the supporters were offering an olive branch that's kind of been refused, and you know what it's like: you make an offer once and it's refused, you probably don't make it again. And I'm really. I'm probably oversensitive about that connection. Um, well, we don't really... want to ruin. I mean, we don't want to go back to the battle days. Exactly. Like, we have this exactly. special, like, like almost everything, more everything. Everything yeah. like has to like. I just want just everything done to kind of maintain that. But also, I, I just felt that there was a chance to just be like, okay, no, we got to play you again yet, yeah? and we're gonna, we're like we're going to be more prepared this time. I just felt the players' reaction at the end told me that they think this is slipping through their fingers as well. Well, the, the only thing I was going to say, too, is almost more important than winning the title this season is what we've built between fans and club and players, right? And like the new artwork and the, the new, you know, the, the new atmosphere at the Emirates and the, the sense of joy. And I realize the results have a lot to do with that. But there are other external factors that are playing into it, loving this squad and loving the way the club's engaging with the, the fans. Like the title may be won or it may be lost, but I don't want to lose this. You know what I mean? And so I, I take your point about how important it is for the that player and fan relationship to be tight. No daylight between us, right? The the problem with that reaction you're describing, Tim, is it almost reminds me of the reaction at St. James Park at the end of last season. And like, I get it. Because the reaction in that game, in that moment, it was gone. It was out of our hands. It was gone. There's a couple games left and we didn't have control over it anymore. So I get it. But it's not gone here, it, it, right? There's a lot of football still to play. You're still top of the table and it's not out of your hands. You have to show that you're not broken by it. Um, and again, a lot of this is just sort of um, fan observation nonsense in the sense that the players could go out and beat Villa 4-0 at the weekend and we won't care that they sat down on the pitch against City, right? So I, I realize that some of this is the kind of stuff we discuss as having importance that maybe doesn't have that level of importance. Clive, the, the tactical battle in the first half was fascinating to me, but before we even get to that, there was one critical decision that I have to ask you about, and it's the decision to start with Tomiyasu on the right. We as a fan base, I think, have maybe gotten too precious about who's a starter and who's a bench player. City don't have starters and bench players. They just have talent, right? Um, Tomiyasu was a star of the season last season. He hasn't been starting this season because Ben White's been a star. Ben White maybe hasn't been at his best, so Tomiyasu comes in. There's, you know, there's not a lot of daylight between those two in terms of talent and capability when they're on their game. Obviously, 
the Tomiyasu performance is something you can get into. But I'm curious what you think was driving that decision, if it was purely a form issue or if it was a way that Arteta wanted to try to play the game that he felt he could get with Tomiyasu that he wouldn't get with Ben White. So I, I try to give an overall view tactically. I think sure. if you look at the last few games, where we've suffered is on set pieces. And yep. I would think Tomiyasu is probably statistically one of our best guys in the air set pieces. So obviously, the, for me, if that's the reason why Tomiyasu played, I think it. I can see that. I can see the thinking. Um, I do think there's another way to look at it. I, I feel Tomiyasu is more of a right back, you know, and he does play like a full back. And I think Ben White plays like a hybrid player, a centre back and a right back. And he can athletically get around just as well as Tommy Asu does. But I think naturally, he's just as happy sitting in. And, and I just felt on this day, seeing the game uh, transpire, I felt it was more Ben White game. When Ben White came on, I think he showed, you should have played me. Do you know what I mean? He came on like a warrior, right? So there's that angle. I just want to get back to his sort of tactic, how the game sort of went. And when I saw the team selection, I saw Bernardo playing left back. I thought, man, that's so disrespectful. So disrespectful to us. We've got to get into that space. And we and we did. We got around him. It took a while for him to get booked. You know, how they played us was very similar in some ways with, with a slightly different shape to how Brentford played us. They got it. They went long and they played from there. They got around Haaland, three narrow. They had a box midfield. And they got into areas and they kept the ball in our area around our last third. Everton kept the ball. I, well, I felt we kept the ball in our last third against Everton. We didn't, I were under pressure, but we decided that's what we're going to do. Right. So, so for me, we're playing in the wrong areas too long. And so I look at mm. ball progression. I look at ball progression. So we got, we got snuffled on the ball. So what are, who's our key ball progressive guy? The guy that comes in the middle of the pitch and gets people out of cul-de-sacs. He wasn't there to pass to. One hesitation, movements are gone, you get robbed. Right? So have you got ability to go, if you can't go around the press, which we can go around the press, but if you can't go through the press because our main person in the middle there is not there, you've got to go over the press, right? Have you got a centre forward or a forward player that can box out apart from Saka that can really hold the ball up front? We haven't. You know, so we were forced and they gambled on this. They went, you know what, we're going to go three at the back. If they go along, we think we can physically take them and we'll get it back off them and we'll keep it narrow. We don't want them going through our midfield. We don't want centrality. We'll keep it narrow. We, we'll trust ourselves to get out to the wide men in time, right? So, and so they didn't do it all the time, but they did. But when they went forward, every time Harlan went through, he didn't need to win it because the bits and pieces were being contested. That unlike Brentford, the bits and pieces weren't contested all the time, but City was smart enough. So they played Brentford with a plus on the end, right? So they were able to mm. get De Bruyne around it, able to get Grealish around it, able to get Gundogan around it, particularly Gundogan, who ran in like an arrow to support Haaland. And so they're, and they're stressing us. So what have we done? We've played a 2 3 5 all year, and we've overburdened our centre backs. So now what are people doing? They're picking on our centre backs. How do we need to adjust? Play another tall full back in the back line. And take the first ball away. Just do it. Stabilize the team. Just do it. Play Tommy Asu left back, Ben White right back, and just do it. In our biggest game at home, Liverpool this year is exactly what we did. They went into yep. the wide areas and we boshed them. And that's what we need to do. And then we decide what we do ahead. Now, what why we don't do that is because we know Sinchenko's been playing brilliant. He's been an extra layer to our team. Hey, mate, the way he's playing and the way Shaka's playing, I know what I would do. You know, and look at the balls that Shaka touches. Look at his pass back, where he's passing the ball from. Are you telling me that's a central midfielder? It's not. You know, he stands in there and off the ball, but it's not. So we have to evolve the team because people are playing within our shape and we haven't got consistent ingenuity to open teams up in open play. We haven't. And, and so we need to stabilise in the back end, take the long ball away, play our biggest defenders, Particularly now we've lost part, you definitely have a tall left back. And then you physically can deal with these teams. And then you have ingenuity in your front five. So separate this, you know, Tim and me always say this, front five, back five. You, have, you look at your back five, physical and psychological balance, and you fix that. And then you say to my front five, okay, you guys, you go and win the game. I'm going to have all of my best talent in that front five. You go and win the game. I don't care what number's on the back of your shirt. Go win the game. 
And we can choose and debate who that front five is. But we have to stop what teams are doing. They're playing within us, showing us wide, kicking us wide. It takes too long to get the referee on our side to make those one-on-ones go mm. our way. And then by the time that happens, we're taking one of our good wide men off and bringing someone else on. And we actually, I'm, I think we're weakening ourselves. You know, so yeah. we have work to do. This is why I love these games. I love them because you learn stuff. And uh, we were learning this last year, lads. We were learning this in April at Newcastle away. We're learning this in February. This is why it's not over. It's not over. And I don't think it's over at all. And we should not throw ourselves into any holes. Obviously, people go through a game <laughs> emotion as they see fit. And I was in a hole last night. And Tim was in a hole last night. We just explained. We all have our reasons for it. And you are absolutely entitled to be in whatever hole you want to be. But that's exactly what everyone wants us to shit ourselves and get into a hole that's exactly what we can't do we've got to get out of this mode and get into this this ain't over mode let's go and sort villa out on saturday morning that's the mode we got to get into and get into it real quick well said and as someone who had norovirus last week i did a lot of shitting myself i wouldn't recommend it so you know just just a thought there Clive, I think you hit on a lot of the key tactical components. And it, it, Tim, it's interesting because we're 20 minutes into the pod and the fact that we're just now mentioning Thomas Party's absence, I think tells you that it wasn't the story, which is a good thing. It's not that he would not have influenced this game in a positive way. He almost certainly would have. One thing that I find interesting is some of the people I've spoken to who are at the ground felt Jorginho struggled. A lot of the people who watched on TV felt Jorginho was pretty good. Yeah, I thought I it was would good. Say yeah, I would say this. In the first half, when we had the better of it, I thought he was more influential in our good moments. I think after Pep took took Mares off, shifted the formation, brought in an extra defender, I thought they really sort of, to use a Clive word, snuffled out Jorginho's position, and, and he was not able to get into the game after that. And I think that cut off a bit of our connections and supply lines to the, to the forwards. Um, I don't think he handled it well, and I think one of the reasons is because while he can do the cute passes and the little interceptions... He can't collect from the back and step past someone. He's not going to step between two guys and, and you know, break a bit of pressure. So I, I do think that he became more of a liability in the second half, not in mistakes he made, but in qualities he can't deliver. Having said that, look, we went into the market, we got Jorginho. The alternative is we're using El Neni right now or we're using um, uh, Lukanga, Sam Lukanga right now. I remember him, I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um and I don't think we would have played any better with either of those two. I think Jorginho's performance outpaced them. So quickly on Jorginho, because I don't think it's the main talking talking point. Do you sort of agree that first half, when we were good, he was influential. Second half, he faded, but that he wasn't the story. And that in and of itself is kind of fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I thought he was fine. Uh, no, no better, no worse. I think you're right. Like most of the team, better in the first half than the second half. I didn't have a huge worry about him coming into this game. In a way, it sounds like Party's going to be out on Saturday as well. In in a way, I'm a bit more worried about it for a game like that than mm. this. Like, look, we've spoken about it before as well. These games, this and this game had it. They have, a, they just have a different temperature. They do. And Jorginho has played in this temperature. He, I hate to remind people, he played he played these guys in a Champions League final and won it. Um, you know, and, and and I really do think in these games there is a big value to that. Um, that kind of I have no recollection of what you're talking about, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, he's played in the Euros final, which yeah. you know, as a as as an Englishman, I might not want to remember either. So, like, and 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 I think in terms of managing the temperature of the game as well, like because he had like it's it's a connective position, like you've said, and he's played. What coming into this game, he's played half an hour for us. So like he doesn't have those relationships yet with like Erdegaard and and Xhaka and players like that that party took a long time to develop. But I mean, one of the upsides of signing a 31 year old from another Premier League club is that they'll probably get that quite quickly. And he looks to he looks to have that pretty quickly. I, I think there's a lot with Jorginho. It's a lot of it is there's a lot of preconception as well and i probably how you feel about the signing will will govern your opinion of his performances because it's one of those positions where you know it's not like the center forward where you go oh he scored a goal this week that means he's good he didn't score a goal this week that means he's bad like it's one of those positions where it's a little bit more a little bit more nuanced than that but yeah i i thought he was fine um well, i really did yeah well here's the point too Can, let's be clear 
The question isn't, was he as good as Party would have been? Because your backup is almost never going to be as good as no. one of the best midfielders in all of the Premier League. The question is, did he do a satisfactory job coming in such that the position didn't become a liability, right? Like, like it's almost like the Enkedia debate. I never ex asked Eddie to be as good as Jesus. I just asked Eddie to be good enough to keep us going. And, and he's largely done that. And we'll come on to whether that... that that started to expose itself a bit I mean, in this game. Same with Jorginho, right? I mean, you're just asking him to allow us to play our football at a level that isn't a huge drop-off from what we'd be doing with our superior starting player. Yeah, season. yeah. And for me, the bigger question here is Thomas Partey once again watching our biggest game of the season in a tracksuit. Mm. Um, that, that's a bigger question to me, and that's one that's going to need addressing. And, and, and I think it will be addressed. I don't think Mikel Arteta is like Arsene Wenger. I don't think he'll sit there going, but next year Abu Dhabi will be fit and he will be the foot. Like I, we, we tried for Caicedo, you know, we, it looks like we're going in for rice in the summer. Like there's surgery coming there. And I, I don't think Mikel Arteta, I, you know, with party, right? We protect him from all the cup games and we're asking him for like 35 games a season at the moment and he can't do it. And next year we need more from that position because we're going to be in the Champions League. And I, th I think all the available evidence at this point says if this time next year we're this dependent on Thomas party, we've made a mistake. Um, so we need, we need to start moving beyond that now. We um we are going to walk the league next season though with our midfield of uh, Santi Rosicki and and Abu Dhabi. So when they all come yeah. fit next season, with it's Jack really Wilshere, the coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, it's nice to see Jack coach. Um, Clive, one, one bit this, on party. I, to say yeah, one yeah, bit please. on party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please do. They ask about party. I'm not sure if it's pre-game or post-game, but you could tell there's a bit of anger there because Mikel said that we found out very late. And if you know all the prep that goes he was in training trains, one day before, how, yeah. how do you how do you train the day before and get injured in the eight waking hours before kickoff? Like, I don't know the whole story yet, but I just I saw that face and I said to myself, "Yes, we found out very late." And we all know the prep that goes into these games, the detail. That means prep was changed, and you know I think I agree with him. Georgino did fine, and I was really positive on him for half time because when other people were nervous, he wasn't. He wanted that ball. He was absolutely fine. However, we had some ball progression issues, shall we say, earlier in this yeah. game. And I think that's timing, that's trust, that's just normal people being in those positions and not quite in the position you expect them to be. And I think to be analysed, mate, in the rewatch, but I'm looking at that as to what happened. That's not a critique of anyone's performance. It's just the balance of the side and what we normally used to doing. Totally agree. I guess it's just like, if someone wants to say to me, if we had bought Caicedo, we win this game, like, all right, go off, King. But, like, I don't think that's true, personally. I mean, maybe. Who, who can predict? Um, and I do think it is, look, party being injured is not bad luck at this point. It's just sort of part of the party experience. But party training the day before the match, completing his training, and somehow not being fit the very next day feels like bad luck. It really does feel like like bad luck. We'll see what comes out there. Clive, I, one thing I think Arteta got right about this is, is, well, two things. He said the game was decided in the boxes. I think that's right. The difference in quality in both boxes. And how we handled restarts. We were just too quick like to, to, to want to play the ball and, and play it before we were set and ready. And we just, we made errors. The errors that are obvious are the ones we made to concede the goals. But I kind of want to start by focusing on the errors of not getting it right when we had the chances to score goals. In the second minute of the game, Martinelli wins it beautifully through a great bit of pressing and gives it to Enkedia, who just shoots on sight when there's other options. It's blocked. Shaka's there, shoots it mile over. That's second minute. In the 10th minute, Jorginho steals it, gives it to Eddie, and he's in. And if he just takes a beat, Martinelli has ghosted in on the other side of the box, totally unmarked. Now you could say, oh, he's he's got a right to shoot there. You know what? Look at the Grealish goal that City score. You know why they score that goal? Because they make the extra pass. They don't just shoot on sight. They have the talent and the composure to make the extra pass. And the extra pass is how they get the goal. And we needed the extra pass there, and we didn't get it. There's the Enkedia header from Zinchenko, right? All three of those key moments happen 
before the bad Tomiyasu pass for a De Bruyne goal. Those are three moments where we didn't have the composure or the execution in the final third that we needed to get our nose in front. And I do think in these big games, Clive, half chances have to become full chances, have to become goals. You, you can't have a 23-minute, 24-minute uh, period where you're the better side and you have openings and you don't convert. So for me, those moments were sort of the story of the game and it continued throughout the game. And I I, I think Eddie and Keddie has done an absolutely sensational job keeping this title challenge, which is what it is, going in the absence of our best player. But I do think it it started to show up in a lack of sort of composure and quality in the critical moments in this game a little bit. And let's not forget, and I will turn this over to you, I promise. Eddie and Keddie is now playing, you know, every three, four days, 90 minutes at the highest level, having never really done that in his career. It's so much football and so much pressure being put on someone who's been just thrown into the deepest end and really done well. But, you know, any, any young player coming into this degree of intensity is going to ebb and flow. And I think there's a bit of an ebb right now. And I thought we saw, I thought we saw that gulf a bit yesterday without wanting to pin this on any one player. That first 25 minutes, I, th I think there should have been more there for us. Yeah. So city gambled to their system playing no left back and they're playing, they want to play in our half. So they want to chin us early, mm -hmm. get the game won and then pass us to death for stability and pace late on. That's what they wanted to do. Right, so they get the goal, we get a goal back. And we, first half, not bad, though. I was quite pleased for half time, funny enough. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, those last six, seven yeah, minutes, it felt like it was turning. Was not bad. So, how can I sum this game up? So, everyone's wondering about the gap between us and them. And if there is a gap, there is a gap in wisdom and managing the season. Because I'll look at the city teams that have been played two, three weeks ago. And it wasn't this team on the pitch. When it mm. came to the big game, everybody was there. You know, this was the best they could roll out. You look at a team that played against Spurs and only people sitting on the bench. And I, I, I firmly believe they target this game. We have to believe, we have to understand with rotation, it's not just physical rest you're getting. It's mental rest. And if anything stood out to me was the lack of mental sharpness in our players. They were sharper. They were reading our passes. They were reading our restarts. We couldn't get two passes off a free kick. They were all over us. They were sharp. They were drilled. They were sharp. Yet we still had the big chances. Just to change the narrative, you have to execute. So they're gambling. They're gambling getting close to us. They're gambling on small distances. Once we break out and we get in, we got to show that word wisdom again. And the wisdom in the last, in the box, we looked young. We looked young. We looked like we we really want to score. You know, Shaka not taking his chance first time. Eddie missing two headers and didn't quite get on the cross. Went with it with his wrong foot. That's three big chances there. Saka wanted to sit the man down first before he scores. You know what this is telling me? They really wanted this, Tim. You know why they were sitting on the floor, Tim, at the end of the game? Because they really wanted this. They targeted this game. They wanted it. You were in the, you were in London, North London, way early, way early. Did everybody want this game? They really wanted this game. It felt like a Champions League semi-final night. It felt massive. It felt like we were playing Bayern Munich back in the old days. It was huge. Everybody wanted it. They targeted it. We targeted it. We want to be in these games, don't we? We sat there and watched these games, everyone else playing them, thinking we're a mile away. We're not a mile away, but we just lack a bit of wisdom and composure at the critical moment under pressure. And we just need to clear our minds and keep playing and keep doing what we need to do, fix the stability issues. On Eddie, I'm afraid, Eddie's a fine player. He's a fine player. But in the last three games we've played, we've played... Everton, they've had Calvert-Lewin up front. He was the best centre forward on the pitch. We played Brentford. They had Ivan Tony up front. He was the best centre forward on the pitch. And we played Man City. Do I need to continue this conversation? Um, <laughs> oh, no. I don't really, because you're not dumb, right? And so that's fine. So how do we adjust? For yourself. <laughs> how do we adjust? How do we tactically adjust to this? 
How do we group players? How do we pair players? How do we change our patterns? Because that's the truth. We are where we are in our life cycle. And this is it. And we're just coming out of it. If you, if I said to you, at the end of Christmas break, I think we had a five-point gap. Right? A five-point gap. Since then, we played Brighton, top team. Newcastle, decent side. Tottenham, Man United. Brentford, tough game. City, just a really tough run. If you win on Saturday morning, that five-point gap will now be three points with the same games. So over that period, we've lost two points potentially if we win on Saturday. So let's get out of the hole and focus on winning on Saturday. That's a two-point differential after all those tough games. We've our centre forward out. We've our centre midfielder out. We have got it all to come back. These players to come back in. I, we we mustn't get Arsenal depressed. Do you know what I mean? Because if we do, we will lose to Villa, and then we we will be looking down at the top four, and that's that's, that's not correct. We just need to. Add some wisdom. Take the pressure off ourselves in both boxes. Calm down. We look frazzled at the back on set pieces. And we look frazzled in the opposing box because we haven't scored for a while. That will change if a win. Stabilise the back door. Add some height. And let's go again and, and get this back on board. Yeah. I mean, that's all really well said. And, like, it seems to happen so often in football. 21st minute in Kedia. Big chance, header from Zinchenko, 24th minute, De Bruyne goal. You know, it's it's the way it seems to come in football. And by the way, <clears throat> for their second goal, Shaka has Nkedia in. He just has to slip the ball to him. Hits it 500 miles an hour into the hoardings on a two-yard pass where Eddie would be wide open and in. One minute later. And he's one, one minute the, later. He's one of the wise ones. He's an international captain, 100-cap player. And he felt the pressure when the moment was on. So this just tells you this yeah. is a collective approach thing, you know, and we've got to grow out of this because we don't want what happened last April and May, do we? Yeah, well said, Clive. There, there's, um, you know, there's some frustrations here too, Tim. I mean, like, look, I don't want to get in the refereeing. I think the refereeing was fine. I got no issues with it. I have issues with it. One of the things that does frustrate me, you can't do to Kane what you can do to Saka. If you do to Harry Kane what people do to Saka, you get sent off. How Bernardo Silva got away with so many kicks and like cynical, not trying to get the ball. I'm beaten. I'll take him out. And it was clearly their plan. I, you know, the, 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 the real frustration I have about the first half is Pep got it wrong. Pep picked the wrong team. I, I tweeted it out ahead of time. I said, you know, Odegaard and Saka should eat that side for lunch. And maybe the reason we didn't do it more is Odegaard, who I thought, Unfortunately, sh shrunk from the moment a bit. Saying that is not fair, right? Because I, I that's impugning his character. I don't mean it that way. I just meant his performance shrunk from the moment. But, but Saka just obviously had the beating of Bernardo Silva. Like that should be a no brainer. And Bernardo's way of dealing with it was fouling him. <clears throat> and I, you know, again, if you're going to let that kind of rotational fouling go, it's not even rotational fouling. One player fouling go. That's a really nice way to shut down our biggest threat against the lineup he got wrong. Um. Do you want to do you want to say anything about that, or should should we move on to some of the other tactical components? Because I th I thought that was pretty frustrating, frankly. Yeah, yeah, it was, and I like I can only imagine that the reason Guardiola did that, like I don't imagine, like because they they did that against Villa um, on Sunday as well, played Bernardo Silva in that 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 kind of quarterbacky uh, left half space position, and <clears throat> you know they 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 don't have Joao Cancelo anymore, who was kind of playing in those places, and they're tweaking a few things to get used to Holland and. Bloody bloody blah. Like I don't think they put Bernardo Silva there because they thought he was defensively equipped to handle Saka and Erdogan. It was probably much more about well, if they don't get the ball because we have someone like Bernardo Silva in this pit, bit of the pitch, then they're not going to get the ball. It's, it's a very similar principle to what we do with Zinchenko. Like he he's not at left back most of the time, and that should be a weakness. But he helps us to keep the ball so well that it doesn't really matter that he's not a left back. Um, it, it is. It remains an enormous frustration that, that I, I don't quite understand why <laughs> how Saka's like how this has become the case with Saka. Um, but I, I think I, I I think you're right overall. Like a, I don't have a big problem with the referee or anything. But like my biggest frustration, I think, because it happened on my side 
all the fucking time wasting I see at the Emirates and that we saw from Brentford. And who gets booked? Tommy Asu gets booked in the 47th the minute in. <laughs> when it's one all like just use your brain man just mm-hmm. use your brain like he's not wasting time it's just all of the players are marked that is all that's happening he's not like mm-hmm. it's one one in the 47th minute like what like why is that a yellow card for time wasting when like goalkeepers sticking the ball up their jumpers and stuff and like phoning their wives before they take a goal kick like all of that's fair game. It's, it's it, that that. Um, I think he got that lot. one. I think he got that one because they gave one to Ederson. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I think I think t- Taylor was sort of like, well, if I'm going to book a city player for time wasting, I got to yeah, you know yeah, I yeah. got to be even about it. And that that search for evenness led him just, to the wrong outcome. It's, it's you know? a fundamental misunderstanding of what time wasting actually is. Yeah. Time wasting is not like this has taken a long time. Quite often there's a justifiable reason. It's you could it's like pornography. You know it when you see it, right? Mm. You I know certainly when, do, yes. when mm. someone's no, like no trying question. to kill the clock. And that's why sorry not to take this on too much of a, a tangent. That that's why I'm not a fan of the stopped clock idea because for me what the stopped clock will do is uh, is like formalize and make and and create an even higher tolerance for killing momentum in games because that's what you're killing. It's not just the clock; it's you're you're looking to break up play. And mm. I think like a stopped clock would legitimize that. But that's that's a whole other subject and a whole other podcast. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's a few other things I want to do first half. Then we'll we'll talk second half. I. There's, let me do this, Clive, because I, I know you want to have this conversation. I, I, I do too, so let's just put it here. I think if we're going to be critical of Eddie and Kedia, which, look, if you're playing, you're, you're fair game for criticism. But Eddie and Kedia is playing because the starting player is not available. And from a backup player doing what he's done, helping us beat Spurs away, helping us beat United at the Emirates, like, I, I have a really hard time being too critical of that. We, we may need to look at some other options in that position to help him so he doesn't have to carry the entire load until Jesus is back. But Granit Xhaka is not a backup player. He's a 30-year-old leading starting player. And I think it's really interesting. I have to go back to this, to Mikel Arteta's interview with Jamie Carragher that was really, really good and somewhat candid. And Mikel Arteta said, I told Granite Shaka, I don't need you to make the difference back here. I need you to make the difference up there. And if you can't, I'll find somebody who can. And he said Granite Shaka came back and he was lighter and he was ready and, and he really made that difference. And you can see the difference it's made for us this season. And Granite Shaka has been one of our players of the season, and everybody understands the importance he has in the group. But I don't think he's making the difference up there anymore. When he was good in this game, he was good in the areas we know he can be good. You know, big switch to Shat to Sack over on the right. Really good, some really good central midfield play. But I'm sorry, you can't mash a two yard pass to Nketiah ten yards out. You know, out for a goal kick. You cannot hold the ball for ten seconds when Martinelli's standing there, pointing to his feet, saying, "Give it to me," and he's going to be wide open. And you try to beat three men first and have it taken off your toe. We're asking a central midfielder in his 30s to play eight, and he has done it brilliantly at times this season. I cannot help but look at him, and I said this on the instant reaction, so I want to say it again. We are all victims of our own bias. We all see the game through the lens of some of our preconceived biases, and our confirmation bias plays a role in how we analyze football. And if you don't see it the way I do, I totally understand. It is not my intention to specifically kill any any one player for how we're doing right now. But the left-hand side has not worked post-World Cup. We, some people are going to point to Martinelli. Some people are going to point to Enkedia. Some people point to Shaka or even Zinchenko. But the Zinchenko and Shaka duo feels a little redundant. And I don't think we're getting the the cleverness, the quickness of thought and feet, the final third skill from Shaka that we need in that left eight. So do you, do you feel that, again, because it's a game of moments, the game is won in the box. Look at the extra pass made for Grealish's goal. Look at the pass that isn't made to Eddie or to, or to Martinelli. That position for me, Clive, is one that I think it, the manager should have his eye on. And he probably does because in the last two games, he's subbed him off for Vieira. So he sees it as an area where there could be a change made. Do you see it as similarly 
potentially problematic or just a blip? Yeah, I I do see it. The front five has lost a lot of its sparkle, apart from Saka, mm. right? And they're, let's have a look at the reasons for it. Odegaard is just he's just topping out a little bit physically. Uh, he's lasting 60, 70 minutes in games, and he, he's disappearing. Um, Eddie now, Eddie has a difficult, a different psychological profile to Jesus. I I tried to speak about him before about what he does when he defaults. When he he defaults to being a number nine goal hanger, and that's what he wants to do. And when you get those chances and you don't score, then you're going to get criti- you're going to get critiqued, you know. Because when other players are isolated on an island because you're not working hard enough down the sides, you're going to get critiqued. You know, the other bit, Tim, I'm telling you, mate, is in the first half. It's on your side. I know where you see it. And Martinelli had gone inside, and there was a position to run in on the right back side. Walker was out of the hole, and he stayed on Diaz, and he marked himself. And if he'd have spun into that side, we'd have broke into that side. And I looked at that and I said, you're not working hard enough, mate. You're not rotating round. You're not rotating. You just want to play centre forward. You know, you want to play centre forward and, and that's fine. But it's, it's, it's killing other players. And I can say that because I had a big lump of football to analyse when other people were playing there. There's just not enough collaboration going on for me. And there isn't enough physicality and he can't change that however I will give the caveat this by saying in the Manchester United game he emptied the tank Um, but I think a few of them emptied the tank and since the high of that game we have not played well you know that was unbelievable night I've never seen him play better everything I'm talking about he did he spun down the sides he worked his centre back he smashed them in the tackle he took his chances he took his first header. The headers in this game, were, they were schoolboy stuff. Literally schoolboy stuff in the box. It's not good, it wasn't good enough. It's not good enough. I'm sorry, the quality of chance taking wasn't good enough. He didn't look at the level. You know, and, and we're trying to win the biggest trophies here. So we need to, we need to be honest. But, but what can we do? I, I think Martinelli is suffering for him desperately. And on to Shaka, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Elliot. I'm starting to look at this position and I'm seeing less of the things that we saw on the sunny day at Gates Spurs when he smashed that ball in the bottom corner. It's never a doubt where it was going. We're not seeing the shots. We're seeing a six foot one centre bid double six putting in crosses from the left hand side. And I'm sorry, we've got players who can do that. We've got players that can live in the half space. We've got players that can commit people with a carry. We've got players that can go around the left winger and cross the ball. We have got quality footballers that can do that job. And yeah. we have to decide our front five, back five balance. And at the moment, it's not right with the if we're going to play Eddie at centre forward. And that, to me, is a debate. You know, and I, everything's on the table. You don't win three, four games. Everything's on the table. You should look at it. You should learn. But it's starting. he's starting to look redundant in there, mate. And Sinchenko's having 110 touches a game, and he is looking like a dream. His ability on the ball is a joke, an absolute joke. It's incredible to watch him. He, he needs to be let loose. He needs to have those 100 touches further at the pitch. And, you know, he needs to be let loose. He has got so much ability. It's staring you in the face. We've got defenders are plenty. You're not getting any minutes. And we've got this guy that can run this team. Let him run the team. Let him use his ingenuity near a Martinelli. Let's get Martinelli back. Let's see people with ability on the ball higher at the pitch. And if he shares it with Vieira, fine. Do whatever. But let people know that position has changed its profile. We need something else, and we're going to be brave enough to do it. We don't need a, ha- a hand-holding anymore. We've got a title to win. And so you need to get your talent on the pitch, right, and see what happens. But make sure you stabilize as well at the same time. Yeah, from the 28th minute to the 82nd minute of this game, we had no shots other than the penalty. None. And the whole team is responsible for that. It's not any one player. Um. You know, it's easy, you know, and by the way, I'm sure there are people listening to this saying, you guys have just picked on Shaka and Nketiah and they created the only goal we scored. Fair. Shaka, ball over the top to Nketiah, fouled for the penalty. But, you know, I think if you see that one moment, you miss the other big moments that went begging and the other ways that there there isn't consistent threat from that side. 
it does tend to be the case that we pick on players when it's whole systems. I think this was a team loss because there were errors at the back that gifted them goals. There were players like Odegaard who didn't make themselves seen, you know, in the game in the way that you'd like to. The only player I, I, I think I would point to, there are maybe two that I'd point to and say, we need to really clap that guy off the pitch. Saka is certainly there. Because Saka just kept running and running and running and doing his thing and getting fouled and getting up and doing what was needed and being combative and being available. And oh, by the way, the way he puts away the penalty, again, a, a, a guy who does not seem phased by that moment. I was sitting there saying, should it be Jorginho taking the penalty? We know that's he's a specialist. Nope, Saka rolls it, uh, Saka rolls it into the corner. No problem. And I think Saliba, who's coming for a rough ride, Tim, who, you know, did struggle against the big physical challenges that he faced against Everton and Brentford, certainly against Brentford, no question. In this game, they were playing long. They wanted to challenge him. He had one time where he fouled Holland because he got a little too physical, but in general, matched the physicality, didn't get beat, didn't get run past, used his speed well. You know, when ball when balls were, had to be played out from the back, he consistently tried to be progressive in the way he can. You know, Gabriel, who, gosh, we, we change our opinion from one game to the next so sharply. Gabriel has been our rock at the back for two months at least. Um, he, he made a critical mistake in this game. It cost us the game, and he did look a little bit ropey in this game. But Saliba, we should at least applaud the fact that in the big moment, in a game where some players wilted, I don't think he did. I think he mm. came back, and, and hopefully it's a sign that he sort of is back because he's he looked great in this game, I thought. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and look, on, on this occasion, the, the two times Haaland had anything in the game, his goal and uh, the penalty, which was subsequently ruled out by VAR, where was he? He was on the left side mm-hmm. of our defence both times. And look, th- there's an element there, I think, to which, I mean, of course you'd attack the left of Arsenal's defence because Zinchenko inverts so much. But ag- again, like we talked about it after the cup game, like where, who did, like, some when you got a striker like Holland, who does he mark? Is almost is like a more interesting question than who marks him, um, because really the striker, in, particularly in the days of the lone striker, the striker dictates that. And we saw in the cup game, put himself on holding in the first half, had some fun. Holding came off, got nothing out of Saliba in the second half, and and I think you could see that Holland carried that into this game, and he didn't really engage with Saliba. Um, on this occasion, and, and when they did, um, I think you're right, Saliba did not look out of place in that contest whatsoever, and the two times Haaland got something, it was on the left side of our defence, not not um, not Saliba's side at all. So, yeah, I, th- I, th- I can't imagine that there are too many defenders who've played Haaland twice this season um, and, and dealt with him that well. Uh, unfortunately, he's so good. I, I, <laughs> fairly depressing conversation pre-match, actually, with... Uh, with a friend and he said look if you're going to play Holland like at least twice uh we got another game with City to go he's like like of course he's going to score like at least like the minimum one goal it, it's just that's that's maths <laughs> compared mm-hmm. to what he produces but I don't I don't feel like Holland was dominant in this game I don't feel like he beat us up or anything like he got a, he's so good he got a touch in the area and he scores because that's that's how good he is but I didn't like in the first game, because I'd never seen us play against him before, you know, your eye just wanders towards certain players. Like when we play Tottenham, I'm always looking at where Kane is on the pitch. I'm like, where's where's Harry Kane? Where's Harry Kane? Because like, because you know how good he is. Um, and <clears throat> and I did that in the cup game. I was like, where's Holland? Where's Holland? Oh my god, it's going to go to Holland. I didn't have that feeling this time. Maybe because I was in the ground as well and had a, a better um, idea of the coordinates. But I I didn't feel nervous about that challenge maybe I did for the first 15 minutes or so and then I was just like no I think Saliba's got this like like I say Haaland's so good that yeah he he might still score in this game but I don't see him like scoring a hat trick or anything like that which which he can very easily do to most opposition well said I have um gotten so enwrapped in this conversation that I have forgotten that we have to talk about something super important (laughs) that we haven't gotten to yet And that is that you need to think about how you're going to start your online business. And the best way to start your online business is with Shopify, the world's best e-commerce platform. Let me tell you something. He says, stopping ridiculous advertiser voice. I have built e-commerce websites. Uh, I am currently building one for my wife. 
who wants to sell some stuff. I have built them for this podcast, which had to be shut down um, because it turns out I'm not great at running a business. That's <laughs> beside the point. Um, I built them for other things. In every instance, I have used Shopify because it's so damn simple. First of all, there are probably multi-billion dollar global companies. You go to their website, you're like, oh, that's a beautiful professional website powered by Shopify. You can build something that looks so professional, just dragging and dropping. They make it so easy. You can put videos in and pictures in, and you can incorporate things from your Instagram account. You can sell on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or you know wherever you want to sell right through Shopify. They do all the payment processing. You can even get third parties to do any shipping you need. You don't even have to have physical product, so you don't have to handle that part of it. It lets you take an idea and turn it into a business. And you know, if you if you look at the way the digital economy is changing what we can do and what we can be in our lives, if you have an idea that you want to start, but you don't know how to get there, I will promise you this. If it involves a website for selling things, Shopify will make it easy for you to do. And there's 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses. Probably should have taken advantage of that last part. Anyway, sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash arsenalvision, all lowercase. Don't know why. Didn't know that matters on the internet, but do it. Go to shopify.com slash arsenalvision to start selling today. Shopify.com slash arsenalvision. And as you know, we are a body positive podcast. And part of being body positive is putting the best things in your body. And the best thing you put in your body is AG1 from Athletic Greens. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, adaptogens, probiotics, you name it. It is uh, vegan friendly, dairy free, paleo, keto, low sugar, you name it. All right. It's got everything you need for long-term gut health, which has been really important to me. And I, I know that sounds like a silly thing. I feel like gut health is not paid attention to. I, um, I had my appendix out and I've read some articles that say that can actually affect the biome of your gut. You know, like we, we thought of it as vestigial, but maybe it's not vestigial. It turns out something that's inside your body is something your body needs. Who knew? Um, I think AG1 has has shown a difference for me in that area. So let's just say if that's an area for you that's important, but also energy. I've gotten uh, a little bit away from drinking as much coffee, which has been helpful. So many good things. It costs less than the price of a of a fancy cup of coffee a day. I would say get rid of all the gummies, a shelf full of gummies that are doing nothing for you but adding sugar into your diet and get AG1. You see so many people who just rave about it. I know you're going to love it. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. I'll be using those next week when I head off to London. With your first purchase, go to athleticgreens.com slash vision. That's athleticgreens.com slash vision. Check it out. Clive! Is that enough of that? Indeed. Now it. Clive, the second half, man, it, like this is the thing. We got back into it. We got the penalty. We got the goal. The Emirates is rocking. We rode out a pretty rocky end to the first half, I actually think. But you're thinking, there it is. We, you know, we didn't take advantage of all of the openings we created, but we are right there in this. Tied with City, top of the table. The draw's not bad. We could go on and win it. Let's come out at halftime and really show them what we're about. And like the second half felt so muted. They made the adjustment. They, they, it really felt like we, we, we failed the test. What I mean is we couldn't figure them out in the second half and they kind of had us figured out. But the thing that hurts, the reason it hurts so much, I don't see a city that blew us off the pitch. I don't see that Liverpool city type game we watched with envy a couple seasons ago where they punched and counter punched like mad and the level was so high. The second half, the level just felt mid and we just made the errors that gifted them the game. Can you explain for me how the second half dynamic changed and why it felt so lifeless in a way? Was there something city did to us to take the impetus away and, and, and push us into the, the errors we made? Cause the second half for me felt like all the life went out of the game and that it was just sort of a, a trudge to the finish line. I we think- didn't have a shot. Till till the eighty second minute, you know. Yeah, I think sometimes, well, a lot of times, I've been lot, involved with a lot of football matches, and the games we've lost, they're almost lost before kickoff. They're lost mm. in team selection. They're lost in preparation, or they're lost in someone not quite right on the pitch. There's there's something that's lost before the game, and I felt this game had an overriding message to it. And you send your team with a message and an approach. And we've gone into a crackling atmosphere and we got the first blow against us, but we've recovered. But even that was a blow to us psychologically. 
to concede that goal. Even though we recovered it, it, it just felt like we just repaired a little bit of damage rather than impose ourselves on the opposition, impose our game, impose our message on them and force them to react. So when it comes to the second half, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of excited because it feels very Man United-like, but they're better than Man United. But I'm looking at it now <laughs> yeah. thinking, okay, what's next? What's the next thing that's going to happen? And I, we play the game. Nothing is tactically is very smart. Lots of coaches on that pitch, pointing and clicking and seeing where to stand. Uh, it's a pleasure to watch an Arsenal team so well coached, so intelligent in the things they're trying to do. It is a pleasure. And please not, let's not forget that. It was a long time we've been waiting for this. We've been watching people standing in the wrong places for many, many years. It's not happening anymore. There are people taking accountability and responsibility on the pitch. But I felt the emotional message got lost when City made that change. To me, I took it with, okay, they're stabilising their team. Smart. They're leaving here with something. They're making sure... They're leaving here. No, we're not scoring again. And if we, if they, they've got enough talent to make sure they can score. And I thought to myself, well, what do we do? What message do we want to send on the back of this? Do we re-stabilise or we, do we say, no, we want all three points? And what we didn't do, we didn't change our message. Our message just got more tired, more emotional, sloppy, and we didn't change the message. We didn't change our face. We didn't change what we were doing. We just continued with our way. And I think this is where Arteta lost the coaching battle. Mm. Sometimes you have a situation where you're coaching against someone you admire. And, and I, I think the admiration goes both ways. But I do think there was desire from Arteta to show we can beat you our way. Go back to the game on New Year's Day last year. That was classic Arsenal. We batted them. We had them. It was beautiful to watch. We outplayed them. We outplayed them City style. We 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 had them beat until the referee stepped in. Right in this game, do you think City were bothered about the City style? No, They're bothered no, about. That the... was. I tried to make that point earlier, Clive. And I'll let, I'll let you keep going. Sorry, it's just no. Like, go on. It, it felt like we were expecting an intense City press and 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 um vice grip around us that we were going to play around and then and get past but they didn't bring it and we didn't know how to handle this sort of softer mid-block kind of looser pl- you know what i mean they, they didn't give us what i thought we were expecting yeah. and we didn't look like we knew how to react to it the, the game new year's day was a true arsenal city game with us just a bit yeah. callow this game was like, we're going to we, we're gonna come up with a system and a way of playing that's going to beat them. We're going to try and beat them this way round or get them to beat themselves. And so they were prepared to throw away their principles and go long. We've been listening mm-hmm. to Gary Neville say for year, for weeks, sorry, they're ignoring Haaland's runs and huh, they weren't ignoring them yesterday, were they, Tim? They were picking no. him out from, from corners of the <laughs> of Blackstock Road. They were picking him out, right? So like basically it was just everything had been fixed for them. But they were prepared to throw away their principles to play to the strengths of the players that they had. They just threw them away, didn't care. And I think he knew that he Pep knew that Mikel would try to play him. And that means playing out. Playing out. And they leapt out and jumped out at strategically smart times and jumped on us, then dropped away, got us comfortable, then jumped on us again. You know, and I felt it made us nervous. Gabriel, he was defensively, he was okay on the ball. He was terrible on the ball. And he's been brilliant in recent weeks. Zinchenko didn't care, top. Jorginho, not bad, actually. But off the ball, hmm, not so sure. Were you in the passing lanes? To be to be confirmed, right? Shaka, mixed. Martinelli, I thought he showed a lot of bright stuff. He looked like he belonged. He was stepping into different zones, looking after the ball, protecting it. He's got a lot. Stop taking him off. You know, stop taking him off. He's got a lot, you know. And um, and so, yeah, I felt we fell into the trap of not playing what's in front of us and maybe focusing so much on playing our style. And if you said to me, we, we're trying to play top Arsenal style, but we haven't got party, haven't got Jesus, I just think those central pillars were missed, which is a tendency when you lose a game without your strongest team. I know it's a tendency to do that. But if 
I, I struggle to think how we can do this without changing the makeup of our front five, back five. I struggle to think how we can get around this. And maybe, just thinking about this a little bit more, the way Eddie is and the best games that he plays, he's a transition centre-forward. He's not a we're in territory centre-forward. And do we have to think about things that way, maybe dropping in a little bit more, playing deeper, giving people the ball, and then transitioning on people? We have to find another way. It's all up for debate at the moment where you don't win. But yeah, man, that's how I feel about it, man, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I There was just, I have to admit, I was frustrated with Mikel too. I thought he waited way too long. I think we make, statistically, we make, we our first sub is the latest of any team in the league. Fine. I actually think there's something to be said for letting your first 11 solve the problem before just immediately panicking and going to the bench. But th this was a game that I felt like we have lost whatever we had. Someone's got to come on the pitch and run around like his hair's on fire for 10 minutes and get the crowd and the team back into this. Because a little belief had gone out of it, a little energy had gone out of it, and we needed someone doing that. Um, whatever the change was. I, you know, I would have been fine with anything that we waited... I think until like the 74th minute, I think, you know, we were behind already, something like that for the first change. That felt wrong. But Tim, here's what the pain is for me. I cannot help it. This is how I see this game. I felt we were devoured by the moment. I felt that we were eaten up by the moment. That if you want to say City beat us, fine. City beat us. There was a lot of quality in the way they finished their chances. I thought we, we, they let us beat us. And I know, look, it's easy to say that just because we gave the ball away. Part of the reason we gave the ball away is we didn't know who to give it to. We didn't have the lanes to pass it. They did start to press a bit in that second half. And we did start to struggle with it. But Sinchenko gave it away trying to do some weird back heel pass he shouldn't have done. And Gabriel kicks the ball not hard enough. And Tomiyasu gifts the ball to Kevin De Bruyne. And like the moment ate us up. And Eddie's not finishing chances. We know he can. And Shaq is standing over the ball for ages before making the pass, and Saka is trying to sit two men down instead of just firing it in at the near post, which he's done time and time again this season. Th this game didn't feel like there have been so many times we, you know, 11 games in a row, I think we've lost to City in the league, and most of them I felt like we were played off the park. Last season at the Emirates didn't feel that way, certainly. This time didn't feel that way, but it didn't feel that way for a different reason. It felt like they just needed us to let the moment beat us. And it hurts because it felt a little like the way the moment beat us at the tail end of last season. Now, tail end of last season, we mm -hmm. can tell ourselves a story about missing players. And we can tell ourselves that story this time, too, if we want no party, no Jesus. But doesn't really explain the mistake. So in that second half in particular, it felt like we we shrank. I, I can't I wish I wish I could go to a specific tactical thing. And I know they adjusted it, and they took Mares off, <clears throat> right? And that did make a difference. They brought Akanji on, and I, I think that did change the game. But do you have maybe a better, <clears throat> excuse me, explanation, or do you agree with the explanation about the way we manage the moment? Because I I can't get away from that. Yeah, I think um, City the way City did tactics, as it were. I think <laughs> that stopped us being a threat, particularly in the second half. I think they cut our legs off in that respect, and I think that was mm. largely tactical. And it's it's not new. We've seen it the last few games now. But I think you're right in terms of the mistakes. Um, you know that that you know what what Clive said after the Brentford game about like this game's been hanging around us um, for a little while. Like we really could have just done with this game in September <laughs> when perhaps this didn't all feel so real because now we're in a situation where we're going to play City twice and obviously look we don't play them again until late April. We don't know what the picture will be. But like we're going to play them twice and it's probably going to feel like a title decider both times. We really could have just done with playing them in September or October when perhaps it didn't feel like that so much. So I, I think something I tweeted before the game, just because there was so much anxiety around and stuff, I'm becoming increasingly conscious that it's been a long time since we won the league and a lot of our fans have never seen it before and never been involved in in this type of thing and I'm trying to do that like slightly like middle-aged person thing of trying to like remember what it was like and uh and I tweeted something before the game like that the biggest thing I took with me from those years those battles with United 
and and just the truism of football, you do not win anything without the games that make you shit yourself. You don't. Like it's not possible to win trophies without the shit yourself games, right? Even like when we've won the FA Cup in recent years. You want to win the FA Cup, you've got to play the FA Cup final. And the FA Cup final is horrible. No sane person likes that. No sane person likes watching their team play under that much pressure. And some of the teams we've played in those finals, it's horrible. And I hate it. But you got to do it <laughs> if you want to win mm. stuff. And I guess my assessment would be Man City play the shit your pants game several times a season and have done for years. And, and we haven't. We haven't. Um, you know, when you finish eighth, there aren't many of those games. You get like cup games and stuff, but everyone has cup games. And, you know, the, the, these games where just the pressure is a little bit different, the temperature is a bit different. They're different. They're very, very different games. And I came into this feeling a lot like, and, and that's the thing in those years when we were going for the title with United, there's years where you don't do it and it hurts like hell. Like, 2002 2003 the season before we go unbeaten that that was awful the way that ended like what one of one of like probably the best football i've ever seen us play was during that season like the high points of that season i think was just the absolute peak of Bengalism, and if anything, we tweaked it to be a little bit more pragmatic. And that, after that, and that's why we went unbeaten. But like the high performances in that year were so so good. Mm. But like I came into this like remembering, I think April two thousand three, we played at home to United at Highbury, and it just felt like it just felt like the end of the world. <laughs> like <laughs> this game, it was again peak at that time, and it was just like when you're nervous the whole day leading up to it and like you don't sleep the night before and all of that. And that's really, really exciting. But like I bet the City players slept better than the Arsenal players last night. Just muscle memory. They just they play this kind of game more often than we do. And this, you know, it hurts now, but it will serve us well in the long term because the next time we go into one of these games, we've got a little bit more experience, a little bit more know-how every time. But at the moment, we're green in these games and they are not. And I think that showed in the second half. Yeah, it's funny, right? Like all That's season good. long, we've been saying, look at the youngest team in the league. It's going to win the league. And like the youngest team in the league also is the youngest team in the league. And so, so, you know, the, the the lack of experience means that you're going to have times where they struggle to manage the moment. It's, it's tough, Clive, right? Because I feel like sometimes as a fan, you say we were devoured by the moment because you can't see the things that happened on the pitch that made it happen. And I know you can see them. I struggle to see them because maybe it's just because I was in a low place psychologically and I'm not giving City the credit for being great. Now, let's be clear. Part of being great is taking advantage of the mistake. The way they punished us for the mistakes is greatness. It Right? The extra pass, the finish, that's greatness. The way, I mean, De Bruyne's first time finish from the Tommy mistake, there's a lot of games where you're going to survive these mistakes because teams aren't going to punish you this way. So I realize that's where the greatness is. Is is there something else they did in the second half to kind of not just kill off our uh, our attacking intent, but to make us feel so pressurized? Because I have to admit, I don't, I didn't see it particularly. I, I felt the, their work rate was excellent, particularly in the front end of the pitch. I thought Harlan played an incredible physical game. It doesn't matter about whether you win every duel; it's just that you need to compete in every duel. And he competed in every duel, and they ran in behind him really well. If you look, I rewatched the first half this morning, so I got that clear in my head. I haven't got the second half yet because I'm too depressed. But basically, sure. I in the first minute, they clip it into our right-hand corner. Tommy has who's running back and, tr- and has a left foot pass back to his goalkeeper. That is not a pass you really want to have because you're under pressure, mm-hmm. right? Now, that tells me something. Tommy has who's on Grealish. They've, he's gone real tight to him. He wants to win, win every battle. He's been told, go man to man, Greenish, right? So they're pinging into a pace, into a space behind him. And we're having to, and he's having to work back, work across, and then and get there first. On the goal, because he's under a bit of pressure, on the goal, on the goal, the ball bounces high. So rather than saying, you know what? I'm going to clip it out for a throw. He tries the same pass with his weak foot at the ball at his highest point. Back to the goalkeeper. What does your Bruyne do? Experience. 
he sees a player not in control of his body, not in control of his next touch, and he gambles on the bad back pass. What does Gabriel do? Tommy would be fine. I'll just let De Bruyne run, run through, run in. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't think the worst thing's going to happen. He's thinking, Gab, you know, Tommy, we'll sort it out, will you? Just get back to goalkeeper and I'll stay here. When you're tuned in, when you're experienced, when you've got mental freshness, you think the worst thing's going to happen all the time, right? And you're back in your mm. hole. So Tommy Asu gets killed, but I'm telling you, Gabriel should have run back with, with De Bruyne. He let him run past him. And these are the things that go when you're mentally frazzled and not quite composed in the moments under pressure. You heard me use the phrase teacup before. Thinking clearly under pressure. Wisdom. We lacked it. We lacked wisdom in the moment. I don't want to, I'm not, I, I really liked what you said earlier about devoured by the moment. I, I think we were up to a point. But I do think sometimes you need this slap. And I, I want it, I want this slap now in February. The last game is May 28th, mate. It's May the 28th. That's a long time away. There's a lot of things that can happen. We just got to make sure that we as a club are not devoured by the moment and we man up and react to this, you know, because the narrative is written, isn't it? Youngest team, manager losing his marbles, players not quite composed enough like they were at Newcastle and Spurs last year. Will they make the top four? People getting injured at the wrong time. The story's written, isn't it? It's been laid up. It's been laid up for us, you know, and um, we've got to make sure we control the narrative. And um, I want to say we're going to get better at this, but I did notice a few too many players not quite composed when it really mattered, I'm afraid, at it. Yeah, I mean, it's weird, right? Because, like, there wasn't... <laughs> the The game really was just a couple of moments where we could have influenced it in their box and didn't. And we gave them an opportunity near ours and they took advantage and everything else. I mean, in the first half felt like we, we had had them. They got it tactically wrong. Second half. It felt like there, there's so many analogies you can use the big brother holding his little brother off with the palm to the forehead, right? The, the weird thing is like, if you look at the stats in the second half, Manchester city played 89 passes. They completed 89 passes. This is a team that completes 600 a game. 89 to our 218. They didn't need to have the ball. They just needed to keep us from doing much. And those 218 passes led to three shots in the second half. They had five shots. They had nine shots the whole game. You know how what those five shots yielded for them in the second half? Four big chances. They just mastered the moments. They chose not to master the football so much, but to master the moments. And Is I don't know if that's Elliot? tactically... Sorry, mate. Is it the moment or is it mm -hmm. the territory? What do you think? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I got to tell you, like, I I don't know. I'm curious. I really do want to rewatch this game, and I'll be looking forward to doing that with you because, like, as much as it hurts me, I want to see if I've seen this wrong because you can't explain a game by just saying we were nervous and we got devoured by the moment. Something had to happen footballistically. But, I mean, there's the one uh, – Zinchenko is spared. He gives the ball away in the penalty box. Ramsdale comes and claims it in the 68th minute. But like, he just gives it away. He just gives it away. You know, the, the, the goal they scored to take the lead, Gabriel just gives it away. And I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think I have a much better explanation for this. And I hate to just go to, to things that aren't tactical, but not everything in football is tactical. I do want to say one thing in Gabriel's favor. For the penalty that gets ruled out by the offside, he is being pulled out of position by Holland. Holland grabs his shirt and pulls him, and that lets him get ahead of him. If if Holland doesn't pull his shirt and get ahead of him, then I don't think Gabriel's in a position where he has to hold. So I don't I don't think you can give that penalty if you're not going to give the the sort of foul ahead of it. And you know I know there's some people that think the penalty we got is soft. I just don't know when it became a rule in football that if you get the shot off, the player can commit grievous bodily harm to you. Like, I don't, I don't know where that became a thing. So I definitely think it's a penalty. Um, we can sort of round the corner on this, but I did get a little nervous towards the end, Tim, because it felt a little, like in the United away game, when we fell behind, it felt like we wanted it so bad we, we didn't have, I felt like we could have lost the United away game real bad. Four, five, you know, whatever, because we started to, to chase and lose our composure and want it too bad. And like, 
I was a little nervous in this game just because I started to see us really pushing and getting stretched and, and they can punish you very badly. So towards the end of the game, were you just kind of hoping let's just get out of this without it doing any more psychological damage? Yeah, yeah. I Again, I'm going to use a comparison to an old United game here because we're talking about how City have like changed their approach for this game and everything. It reminds me of, I'm going to go back to that 2002-03 season. We went to Old Trafford in the first half of the season when we were flying, playing the best football and they put Phil Neville in central midfield and they went f- for the first time, they went full, we're just going to kick you mode and they beat us 2-0 and they played like the underdogs and, and it was much more like in your face than what City what City have done is a bit more sophisticated than that. But it was the first time that really that United under Ferguson kind of admitted that we were the better team and was like, okay, we'll adapt and we'll beat you and we're not too proud to do that. And and here Arsenal have got that, it, it giveth and it taketh away and it tooketh away last night. Arsenal have got that, not just youthful, but we feel like we're the team on the up at the moment and we've got that, you know, we're going to give it to you, we're going to show you, we're going to go our way. Whereas City, you know, to borrow your analogy, Elliot, in the stage they're at, in their cycle, the experience, their players and that squad, et cetera, et cetera, are much more comfortable going, okay, we're going to let you swing and we're going to let you get tired swinging we're fine with that. We're okay with that. And that's, listen, That you don't get everything overnight. That's probably the next step for Arsenal because what we've basically seen Arsenal do this season, and, and it's been 95% brilliant and responsible for our success, is just go at every team the same way. Just go, we play our way, we pin you back. And that's worked for us to this point. Maybe it's not working for us anymore. Maybe it will. Maybe we'll go and do that Villa on Saturday and be fine and then we'll do it to Leicester and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's 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 like there's I wrote about this today, um, tap your mug, but that there's there's a tweak to make. And what I'm really interested in the evolution of this team is are we gonna be like Klopp's Liverpool and just be like, Yeah, you know what's coming, you know exactly how we're gonna play, but we're so good at it that it doesn't matter. Like you can see me like pulling the trigger on the gun. It doesn't matter if you can see it because you can't stop the bullet. Do, do we? Are we going to try and become that team or Guardiola? Like you know, playing Bernardo Silva at left back, like it's the most natural thing in the world, and we don't even talk about it because it's Pep and and everything like that. Are, are we the team that tweaks around the edges with things? And and obviously the the team is not mature enough. And again, it's not just an age thing. Like the life cycle of the team, like. Is not yet mature enough. We don't have the answers to those questions. Are, are we the team that tweaks things? Are we the team that becomes comfortable going to another big team and going, okay, we're not going to do exactly the same thing today. We're, mm. we're going to let you swing a bit. We're going to let you punch a bit. And we're comfortable. We, we're going to let you punch us in the stomach and we'll take it, but we're not going to let you hit us in the face kind of thing. That's That's what City were doing last night. It was take some punches at our ribs. Our ribs can take it, but we've got our chin nice and protected. And and, and so that that's what I'm really interested in. But to, to really answer your question, I always, in tight games, I stress test myself with the same question, which is, would you take a draw? <laughs> right? And sometimes I do it like, let's say we're 1-0 down at home to Bournemouth with 10 minutes to go. I always do that stress test in my head. Would you take a draw now? Because that tells me how I feel about the likelihood of what's going to happen. And sometimes I'll be like, no, I think we can score twice. I want the win. And sometimes I'll be like, Jesus, I think we could play all night and not score. Yes, I'll take a draw. And on about maybe maybe just after that Zinchenko <laughs> mishap that you referenced, I think it was at that point I said to myself, would I take a draw now? And I said, yeah, yeah, I would because I could feel... Sometimes you feel it before you see it. I could feel how this half was going and it wasn't that City were clobbering us. It wasn't that they were pinning us back or anything like that. But you get a feel for a game sometimes and I was I was just feeling like like when they went 2-1 up, even though I don't think they'd had that many shots or anything, I wasn't surprised at all. That to me just felt like the the direction the game had gone in. Yeah, and the thing that's hard is I don't know how you legislate for errors. You know what I mean? Like if you're the manager and you see the game going the wrong way, there are some things you can do to change it. And I was frustrated that he didn't. But you're not going to take Gabriel off, right? Maybe you're going to take Zinchenko off and go with Tierney. I don't know. But like, 
how do you legislate for Gabriel giving the ball away, right? How do you legislate for some of the errors? I don't know. I think also in your big games, you need a couple of your big players to to lead. And I don't mean lead with blood and thunder. I mean lead with their with their performance. And if we're going to lavish Martin Odegaard with praise, which we have all season and we should, I, I think we have to at least say he he's someone who will probably look at this performance and say, I didn't I didn't really give give a performance that I want to on that big stage in that moment. The guy is still absolutely extraordinary. And by the way, <clears throat> you know, De Bruyne didn't have a great performance, but in two big moments, he made two critical, critical plays that turned the game. The first goal to open the scoring. And didn't he make the pass that cuts us open for the ho- the Holland winner? Does he play that ball? He cuts it back, I think yeah. he does. He cuts it yeah. back. Yeah. Um, or yeah, the, sorry, the cutback for, yeah. Anyway. Um, so Clive, now we have to go win at Villa. Like there's just, there's just no question. And I think, you know, Arsene Wenger said you go up by the stairs and come down by the elevator. You can also come down by the trap door. You have to make sure it's not a free fall because I do think it can get in your head. And I do think it can suddenly become our football's not working. Do I go to a back three? Now you're changing it. Now you're using players. You're not sure you trust. You've lost your identity. Someone's got to get these guys in a room and say, you're tied at the top of the table with a game in hand and you earned the position to be there. So just go beat this crappy Villa team and remind everybody why you're at the top of the table. Easy to say, hard to do. What has to happen to stop this from becoming free fall um, starting with Unai Emery, who, as we know, will uh, will be very motivated to get his Villa team up for our visit on, of course, the first kickoff Saturday. Yeah, I think, I think Tim's point about what we want to be is, is really the point, uh, how we want to evolve. I think there's a little bit of both of us, of City and Liverpool in us. We, we play a little bit of the City pattern play, positional play. But we play at a much higher clip than City do, so a bit of Liverpool in there. And but what have people done? They realise we've got this really front-footed, aggressive front four. They want to nick the ball and play on the front foot and face your goal. And Gabriel Jesus, the best defender in the league, Eddie's not bad at that. To be fair to him, he works hard on occasions. His recovery is not great all the time, but he does pick his moments to press. And so. What a team's done. They're making sure our front four are now receiving it back to goal. They're not receiving it facing the goal. They're not receiving it in pressing transition movements, running forward. They're receiving it back to goal and they're getting kicked again. Right? So so they've tactically evolved. They're going over us, making us work hard. Then when we have to play through, we play through congested areas in the middle of the pitch and we're playing to people tightly man-marked. Right? So... We have to keep going and make be really, really accurate, and we haven't been. So what do we do? Do we focus on accuracy? It's really important to us. Cohesion, timing, really important. State stability, competing better on the long ball, having the right physical profile to to do that and say, look, this is what teams are doing. We need to, we need to discourage them from doing it by take it by making a selection. It's not a drama. People, we have three, four teams doing it. You just you take that away and say, now what are you going to do? You don't let them have their game plan. You take it away, and then we have the ball, and then we can play what we want to do. I think there's a um, a few people that are flattening out for tactical reasons, and I think we have to find another layer within the group. And to be fair to the to the club, they have bought players that can bring something to the group, and. They need to be on the pitch, a couple of them. And we need to be brave enough to be comfortable, brave and comfortable enough to accept those changes. And we need to just execute on on those changes. I am not I'm not concerned about any particular player getting his feelings hurt. We've had a good stretch of games where we haven't really seen it. And I always tend to look at the front end of the pitch, Elliot. Back end, back door's easy, right? We've got the players. We can you know my views, uh, Tim's wrote it there, right? Um, Tommy, Tommy Asset left back. You know my thoughts there. I think it works for us. I really do. I think it stabilizes us. And and I want to see the front five change. I want to see a, a few, a bit of ingenuity in there. I want to see more personality and ingenuity. And people need to sit for two, three weeks. Let them sit, recover themselves mentally and physically, 
this season is not done. We need to be brave enough to, to say, you know what, maybe Odegaard, Shaka, maybe you have to sit for a bit. You know, just sit and have a look at it. I saw what he did to Ben White yesterday when he came on. He looked like somebody who said, I'm not coming out of this team. You know, and sometimes you need that little jolt to say, look, you know, sit, have a think. Is Saturday morning the time to do it? I'm not sure. But let's have a think about where we're going and, and make it a bit more of a squad game because we need it to be a squad game because I'm worried about some of the frayed edges I'm seeing and that's not down to ability. It's probably down to fragility, experience, but also maybe a little bit of fatigue, mental and physical. Yeah, I mean, one way or another, your favorite player might get dropped. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, but what's important is what what gets the team firing again. And like, while I don't tend to look at Martinelli and say, oh, that guy's the, the issue, right? Because I, I see things my way and you see things your way. Whoever needs to be brought in to, to get this going the right direction is is who's going to come in. And we have to not just be okay with that, we have to welcome that. And like, I'm sure there's City fans that wish Foden played more. Oh, Mares shouldn't start. He stinks. Like, those debates happen at all the clubs, but they keep winning because they trust their talent and whoever plays is expected to deliver and, and usually does. Um, so that's how we're going to have to be. And like, yeah, I'd, I'd try Vieira over Shaka, or I'd give Trissard a chance at false nine to bring our, you know, our connections back. But if it is Trissard for Martinelli, then that's what it has to be. I mean, you know, maybe it's Tierney coming in for a game. The The manager has to trust the group. And I do think one thing that we've always sort of talked about with Mikel is, does he rotate? Does he know how to rotate? I mean, he obviously knows how to rotate. Does he do it enough? The, the Europa League is coming back, by the way. If we had a six-point lead at the top of the table, I'd be like, punt it, just punt it, get rid of it, punt it, play for the league. But now that we're in this position, Tim, and we'll finish on this, we're probably the outsiders for the title now. And I know you say, we're, we're level on points with you know a game in hand. Look at the fixtures. It, 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 it's not great. City don't actually have much left, and we have to go there. I don't know that I want to turn this season of so much promise into... And we wound up finishing a distant second and we we crashed out early in the Europa League because we punted it. Maybe finishing a distant second and winning the Europa League would be viewed as a, I mean, look, finishing second period would be a phenomenal step. But like, I think he's in a tougher position now, I guess is what I'm saying regarding how to confront the Europa League. But like, if he rotates, you know, if Smith Rowe is back and Jesus is back, you could be playing Smith Rowe in the Europa League and Eddie and Ketty in the Europa League and Jorginho in the Europa League and Vieira in the Europa League, you can do some heavy rotation and still have a good team out there. So do you think we need to start rotating? And do you think the position we find ourselves in now maybe changes your calculus on whether you would look at the Europa League as a target? Yeah, I, I think the January transfer window changed my calculus on that. You know, bringing Jorginho and Trossard in. Um, I'm hoping that one day in the near future, Emil Smith-Rowe might be able to play a game of football. Um Someday, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like so, and and also, I, yeah, I, I think it's it's probably too delicate to to like like you can't just lob competitions anyway. Like it doesn't work like that. But like, yeah. e even skillfully going out, <laughs> I, I think I think it's probably too delicate to do that now. And and look, it's if if we go where we want to go. We're going to have this anyway. You know what I mean? Like you want to be in the latter stage of competitions. You want to be in Europe. You know, we're not going to have Europa League group stage in the autumn either. So players are going to have to get used to playing a bit more. And I'm sure they're fine with it. I, I think it's something that we fans probably worry about a bit more. For me, the FA Cup, I found dispensable, but more because I thought one of the... I didn't think we could do three, basically. Two... Okay, three. I, d I don't think we're at that stage yet, and and look, we can see it at the moment, right? I think one of one of our biggest killers at the moment is that we can't switch in Ketia, mm. is that we can't like we can't bring on another striker for the last twenty thirty minutes of games just to vary things up, and like um, usually I'd, I'd really like push back against things like this because they just sound really simple, but actually, if I could wind the clock back two weeks, I might I might 
think about Balakan, you know, calling mm. him back and saying, actually, because my primary reason for not doing that would be he's going well, he's playing lots, let him go well and play lots. That's that's kind of what we want. But there, now I'm kind of thinking, yeah, I think you'd get plenty of football at Arsenal at the moment. Um, yeah. You know, you'd be involved. You'd be involved. You wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be sitting next to Emil Smith Rowe and Thomas Party in their season ticket seats. You'd be you'd be in there, you'd be playing. He'd have been on for the last 25 minutes last night. So, you know, mate, look, we can't, so there's no point in talking about it, but maybe that's something I'd revisit in hindsight. But, and and to Clive's point, we need some of these players involved. Like, look, I think Kieran Tien is going to go this summer, right? Because he's on frozen out territory at this stage. He's on the bench, unused sub pretty much every game, not really involved. I think we can see where that's going, but... Like one of the issue, one of the reasons a lot of managers, including Pep, actually quite like tight squads, is because you don't want those guys around, and it's not because who, who are not happy, and it's not because they're troublemakers, it's not because they're like stomping their feet like children or anything, but like Kieran Tierney, or London Colney is probably not smiling very much at the moment, mm. and by the way, rightfully so, because. Yeah. You don't want players that smile when they're not involved. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we do have a couple of them still in the team, uh, in the squad rather. So mm-hmm. like, rightfully so, but there's a balance there. You, do, you don't want like someone who's just like, you know, pushing his food around the plate in the canteen at lunchtime. You know, you want everyone to feel involved. And, and so, yeah. And, and look, I, I think Villa on Saturday is a chance not to make like five or six changes. I think one of the things we're going to have to get used to is that gentle rotation, that two players a game, three players a game. You know, last night, um, Arsenal made the fewest starting lineup changes this season in the Premier League. City mm-hmm. have made the most. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, of course, City have made the most because they got the most money and they've got... Yep. Uh, they, they, it's not that they've got the most players. They got the, they don't really have squad players, right? All of their... They have 20 players, but they're all top quality. But we've got to get used to becoming that, that team that changes a couple of... Like you if can't... you're Unai Emery preparing for Villa on Saturday, you you probably got quite. It's probably not a difficult job to do. Executing might be difficult. He'll know his game plan. Like everyone knows what's coming from Arsenal now, and everyone's just going to do the same thing. And and I do think there's there's got to be a bit more of an element of surprise. And Villa's going to be the third game in a week anyway, so you kind of have to rotate anyway. You know what you can't be. You can't be the team that's made the fewest lineup changes and makes the latest average first sub. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what that and says I, is you're playing these guys into the absolute ground. Yeah, and, and I don't think Arteta wants that overall because mm-hmm. what's happened with Trossard, we've got Trossard now. He's the first one off the bench every game and he's he's coming or he came on 58th minute, Everton 60th minute against Brentford like Trossard, Trossard's a fun new toy for Arteta, <laughs> you know, and and so he, I think he wants that. I just think we're we're still building that second layer, and unfortunately, the guys in like the second layer who are closest to the first layer are pretty much all defenders. It's like Jorginho, Tommy Asu, um, and players like that. We 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 could do with a couple of Jorginho, Tommy Asu forwards. I think. You know, it's interesting too. It just, when games happen matters because not to make this about the refs again, but if we had gotten away with the Brentford game, if that VAR call goes right and we get the three points, do we maybe just look the slightest bit less nervy in this game? Because it doesn't feel quite as existential and maybe that pass finds an Arsenal shirt instead of a City shirt. You know, maybe that extra pass, I don't know, like I, just playing City in this moment where we sort of had a moment of self-doubt. Because look look at the FA Cup game. We rotated. We played the Matt the Eddie had, and we looked like a match for him, frankly. You know? Um, and we were coming, we were arriving in a good moment then. We arrived in a bad moment here, and I, I think maybe that had an impact. So I think we can leave it there. I We will try to sneak in a rewatch, but like, I mean, it's crazy. The, the Villa game's right on top of us, and of course it's the first game on Saturday. I guess the good news is you get to wash this taste out of your mouth quick, you get to win heavily at Villa and it's back over to you city as we go back to the top of the table. And so, you know, I'm not expecting anyone to do us any favors against city in the next few weeks, looking at their fixtures, but champions league is coming back and the FA cup is still out there for city. 
So it's it's not going to be straightforward. And maybe it is 88 points or 86 points that wins the league this season. You know, let's focus on getting as many points as we can get, not focus on how many points City are going to be able to get. Because if they run the table and get to 98 points, we weren't going to get there anyway. You know, so let's just try to remember where we are. And before we start worrying, if we can stay top four this season, let's remember that we are top of the table tied with City on points with a game in hand. I realize they they have the goal difference edge, but you get the idea. Um, Okay, a tough game to parse, a tough emotion to get through. I know everyone's pretty low. Let's hope the team lifts us and maybe we can help lift them. I'm sure Tim will be there ready to help lift them on Saturday uh, lunchtime. Tim's on Twitter at Stillmanator. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. I'm through my rough patch. Come on, Arsenal. I know you can be through yours. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith. You can me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Hang in there, everyone. We love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Villanelle.